Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 14th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the significance of the ongoing increase in oil prices to the Alaska budget. At the levels projected by the futures market, the FY23 budget now balances at a full statutory PFD. Second, we explore, now that the budget is within range of a full PFD, how various interests are emerging from the woodwork to spend that increased revenue elsewhere. And third, we explain our significant concerns with the governor's recently proposed renewable energy program. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk about the the weekly top three, starting off with this projected fiscal year 23 revenues, now a billion dollars above and beyond what the fall forecast says. And what, but what does that really mean? What does that really mean when it's all said and done? So the fall forecast was predicated on uh, 71, the traditional revenue side of it was predicated on $71 oil which at the time seemed high, uh, but has gone much higher since. Uh, the futures price for, uh, average futures price now for 2023, fiscal year 2023, uh, has jumped from the $71 included in the fall forecast up to $87, $16 higher. Um, uh, uh, and, and that higher uh, runs, across, runs across the board. Uh, the the ten year uh, future strip is now higher than the fall forecast all the way through uh, the end of the ten years. Not that much higher, not as not sixteen dollars higher, but but uh, but higher across the board. That translates into unrestricted general fund. The, the the effect of the higher oil price coming through on the royalty side and coming through on the production tax side uh, uh, results in higher traditional revenues. In fact, it's a substantial jump uh, from the $2.6 billion forecast in the, um, in the FY23 uh, fall forecast and, and what the governor's FY23 budget is predicated on, from $2.6 billion in traditional revenue. That $16 jump from $71 to $87 oil uh, results in jumping the, uh, uh, the traditional revenues, traditional UGF revenues, to $3.7 billion, more than a billion dollars higher uh, than, the, than the, uh, uh, the traditional revenues included uh, in the fall forecast and on which the, the budget's based. That translates through uh, in, terms of, in terms of how the budget looks uh, from a deficit, uh, at current law deficit, uh, counting the, the PFD at the statutory levels, uh, that was in, uh, a deficit that was included in the fall forecast. The fall, uh, the FY23 budget using the, the current oil price now balances. Uh, there's $4.6 billion, $3.7 billion in traditional revenues. Uh, current law uh, has the, uh, the portion of the POMB draw that goes to the general fund uh, as, as what's remaining after the statutory PFD is taken out. That's how current law works. Six hundred million dollars from uh, the uh, the POMB that that goes to government, and then the governor threw in another four hundred million dollars from uh, 
from federal federal revenues, COVID revenues that can be used toward uh, uh, can be used toward uh, uh, state spending. That jumps the budget or the the, the revenue side from uh, significantly lower, from about uh, uh, 3.7 billion dollars, 3.5 billion dollars in the fall revenue forecast uh, to 4.6 billion dollars. So the budget. Uh, the current law budget, full statutory CFD, now balances uh, based on the higher oil prices. That doesn't continue through the 10-year forecast. There continue to be deficits, current law deficits, uh, uh, in the budget uh, from FY24, FY24 through the uh, through the end of the decade. But the FY23 budget at least balances. So there's it's a significant impact. Uh, those higher oil prices are having a significant impact. Uh, on the uh, on the FY23 budget. Now, you know, we can get into a debate whether those high, higher oil prices uh, uh, continue, whether uh, uh, whether there's a, 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 a reaction to the higher oil prices in, turn to, in terms of demand drop, and and that uh, that has an impact on price as we get into FY23. But as of right now, uh, we've jumped a, a billion dollars higher, and that's a I think that's something that we ought to note. Uh, at least uh, uh, when it occurs, and uh, and look at the uh, the consequence if that oil price was realized. All right. Well, let's take a peek at it. I mean, I mean, I guess my main concern is this is all very. Here's been my concern from the beginning, and you could tell me if I'm off base on this or not. My concern is that this is all very short sighted. We see it in the short term. Oh, look, we're going to be well, but it's in the year three and four and five that all of a sudden we're going to be right back to where we were again fighting it out and duking it out over the PFD. Yeah, well, and, 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 as, and as we'll get into in the second segment, we're going to duke it out this year because now with this additional cash, everybody's got ideas on how they can use that additional cash, which will, which will unbalance the budget again. And, and as, as, as the legislature has been doing since 2017, uh, uh, take, it out of the, uh, take it out of the PFD. So we're going to duke it out this year. Uh, but at least as of it, it's it's worth noting at least as, as of this ten seconds uh, the budget is uh, uh, is imbalanced the current law budget is uh, is imbalanced but you're exactly right I mean you go to 2024 even at what the current what the futures market is telling us about oil prices uh, 2024 there's a 400 million dollar deficit 2026 700 million dollar deficit 2027 uh, there's a uh, 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 an eight hundred uh, million dollar deficit. So it's so we're we're looking at deficits um, uh, all the way uh, all the way through the remainder of the decade of some substantial size. This is this is an aberration. This year FY twenty three uh, is an aberration in terms of in terms of the impact. Uh, uh, it's because oil prices decline. I mean the interest market is saying that oil prices decline after uh, FY twenty three. Um, so this year is an aberration, and and we do duke it out in the, in future years. But and and but we're likely going and we're likely going to duke it out this year because of people uh, talking about increased spending. But at least uh, at this point in time, uh, oil prices have 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 increased enough uh, that we've uh, that we've found a temporarily, I guess, a, a balance on FY twenty three. All right. Well, I know you wanted to do some. Uh, I know you wanted to probably so sh- show some charts and stuff. Which, luckily enough, I do have uh, the chart that you included in your uh, uh, in your message to me, so I could put that up on the screen if you want to discuss that. The comparison of traditional revenues, and I'm ready to do that whenever you are. So proceed ahead. Well, it's um, uh, that chart shows uh, the uh, traditional revenues at. Uh, uh, at the spring forecast, which is in blue, uh, the fall forecast, which is in red, and based on current futures market, which is in black. Uh, and it starts in FY22, the current fiscal year, and shows that uh, we're having a surge in revenues. Those are probably, those are more secure because we're, what, 60% of the way through the year right now. So uh, we're likely going, we're, 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 we're going to achieve revenues in FY22 that are in excess of what was included in the in the fall forecast? Uh, what I've been talking about is FY twenty three, which is the next uh, uh, the next slide over, and that's or the next uh, uh, piece over, and that's uh, that's where the three point seven billion dollars in projected revenues tradition or traditional revenues now shows up compared to the red, which was the fall forecast of two point six, and the spring forecast, which was one point nine. 
on at the top of that chart are oil prices, and you can see the uh, the eighty seven dollar oil price for twenty twenty three, and then see the decline in oil prices that the futures market is projecting down to eighty dollars in FY twenty four, seventy seven and twenty five, seventy five and twenty six, and so on, which results in declining uh, traditional revenues, which op- as I said before, opens back up. Uh, deficits in the uh, in the projected budget that uh, that the governor did, the projected ten year forecast, but right. but we we are better off uh, through all those years based upon the current futures market, and we're in balance again, just probably temporarily, but in balance uh, for FY twenty three. Well, and again, that's good. Um, long and shorted here there for me though, Brad. Where does it where do we, where do we end up when it's all said and done? I mean, how does how does this end, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about some of that in the second segment, Michael, uh, because we're going to talk about the people who now want that money, uh, the increases that are uh, people uh, coming forward and asking for increases. Um, so it's going to, it, uh, what it leads to is now uh, requests for that money uh, and, uh, and people uh, having ideas about, uh, like Les Guerra's defined benefits program, um, and uh, and other things, uh, people now uh, coming forward and saying, "Well, if we got all this extra money, extra compared to what we would proje- what we had projected, uh, then uh, then I've got a place for that." Um, and so we're going to talk we're going to talk about in the next segment what happens uh, as we start talking about these additional requests for money. Where is it coming from? Whose pocket is it coming out for? Right. Out of who's who's going to pay? Uh, uh, as we get into uh, as we get into the next phase of this. All right. Well, before we jump into number two, then let's finalize. Let's go back one one quick click here. Then back to number one, talking about all these new revenues projections and the billions. How much of this is? How much of this is accounting voodoo? How much of this is you know is is moving stuff around in the right way? And how much of it is is you know I think real and, and and I guess were true. And if Brad was the one that was writing these projections, how different would they look? Well, I think the projections are pretty good. I mean, the projections are our Department of Revenue's forecast of revenues at certain at certain oil price levels, traditional revenues at certain oil price levels, and 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 the real the soft spot uh, in in all of that is whether the futures market is accurate, accurately predicting what the, what the revenues are going to be or what the oil prices are going to be. We know that oil prices will differ from the, from the futures market, but we don't know how much, uh, and we don't know, frankly, we don't even know in what direction. So, so this is sort of a, sh- a, 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 a look in time, uh, a, 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 a snapshot in time of where we are uh, if the futures market uh, oil prices were uh, – uh, were were realized over the next fiscal year and over the subsequent uh, ten years. Uh, that's the soft spot. Uh, whether whether the market whether the oil prices actually achieve those. There's not there's not much moving around uh, other than that. If Brad were doing this, Brad would be looking at uh, at a at a smoothing of oil prices, a smoothing on the revenue side, uh, consistent with a spending cap uh, on the on the rev- using a revenue based spending cap. Uh, that would say, you know, we can't count on the futures market at any given point in time. We're going to look back in history a little bit, and we're going to smooth uh, smooth oil prices over time. So, uh, taking into account the lower oil prices from earlier years, we would have a lower we, we would we would have a lower revenue projection or a lower revenue base that we were using for budgeting. But right now, I mean, right now, the governor's using the legislature's using uh, projected prices, projected oil prices for. Uh, for their uh, uh, for their budgeting and and so the, those projected prices that they're using, which is based on the futures market, uh, is, uh, is moving in a positive direction and uh, in, in in moving in a substantially positive direction. Harold uh, in the chat room, always one to stir the conversation. Up, Brad says, "Where does the flat tax fit in all this now?" Because it's all. <laughs> oh, there's still there's still deficits, Harold. Uh, there's I mean, there's st- deficits yeah. deficits in FY twenty four out to the uh, out to the end of the decade. Yeah. Um, and if we want to, if we want to have uh, continued spending, which evidently you know the legislature wants to do that, and we want to have uh, statutory PFDs, uh, there's deficits that have to be filled. There you go, Harold. Mission accomplished. You got him to say flat tax. That's what it is. Uh, if that's what we want, and, and I think that's the big thing here, uh, Brad, is if it is what we want, and I think more and more. 
you know, most people don't want new revenues. They want the spending to be controlled. Unfortunately, we got a bunch of yahoos in there who basically just say, no, we're going to do it our way. We're going to do We want to spend and we're going to protect the government spend no matter what it costs the rest of the Alaskan economy. Well, you know, we had that test in 2019. I mean, the governor, the governor proposed uh, the deep spending cuts, uh, and we had the, the pushback in the legislature. You know, he, the governor couldn't even get 16 to support it, to support the, the spending cuts uh, uh, that, that he proposed. He ended up with much smaller spending cuts, which we've since lost through spending increases elsewhere. Um, and the governor's not the governor's not even proposing spending cuts anymore. So uh, significant spending cuts anymore. So it's um, I mean, we, we had that moment in time where he tried in 2019, couldn't even get 16 legislators to back him up, 16 out of 60 to back him up. Uh, and, and that moment in time seems to have passed. You know, I often think about, well, Mike, what would you have done if you were governor? And you know what? I, I got to say, I think I still would have stuck with it. I think I would have. I mean, that's what I promised. That's what I said I was going to do, even if I was going to be only a one-term governor or maybe even less. Maybe the recall continued, although I think the recall didn't have a chance in the long run once COVID hit. I think I still would have proposed. A, I would have stuck to those and and proposed in reducing budgets. That would have laid it all at the legislators' feet. I mean that they they would have been the ones that had to live with that. And uh, I, I mean, I I really think that that should have been done. Yeah, he ran. He I mean, he he at, at that time the administration with Tuckerman as chief of staff, uh, he was. I think he was prepared to push it through. But when they went to count noses in the legislature, they didn't have 16 to back him up. So what he was going to do is is propose is is stick with those stick with those vetoes, veto back down to the budget that he'd originally proposed, um, and put those legislators on the hot seat and see if um, see if you know when when it came time to count those publicly, 16 uh, 16 stood up. But they they didn't have 16 in private. I mean, the reason they backed off is they didn't have 16 in private. So. You know whether whether you know put out in the light of day, sixteen would have would have stood up with him, um, uh, even though they told him they couldn't do it in private. I don't know, but that's that's where that's where the rubber met the road when they did when they did the nose count uh, uh, on uh, on whether they had sixteen to back him up. Well, I think, and I'm going to start off with this as we come back from the break. But Kevin McCabe nails part of the problem. He says the problem is we never get visits or emails from people who want us to cut the budget to limit spending. All we ever get is visits or emails from people who want more, more, every day, all day. And, um, I mean, they are active. I will say it. They're active and they are out there. And uh, I I think that that is part of the problem. We're going to talk about number two, which, of course, is now that we've identified the fact that there's going to be surpluses and all this money, people are going to start coming out of the woodwork. We were just talking during the break about how there was no political will, it seemed like, to cut, that we want the budgets to be cut, but maybe not anybody else. Kevin McCabe, uh, Representative McCabe, says the problem is we never get visits or emails from people who want us to cut the budget to limit spending. All we ever get is visits or emails from people who want more, more every day, all day. And we're about to see more of that. Right, Brad? I mean, that's kind of the that's kind of the business as usual aspect of what we're seeing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, The legislature is going to see that. And, and, you know, why, why don't legislators get emails or visits from people who want them to cut the budget because there's there's no money in for uh, the, the money for individual citizens who want spending cuts uh, is in better PFDs now does that fund a trip to Juno to visit your legislator probably not it, it funds maybe an email or certainly comments on on social media on Facebook pages but it, there's not there's not money in it, enough money in it for individual citizens to, 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 to realize from those budget cuts to really fund a concentrated effort uh, 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 to hire a lobbyist or have a concentrated effort to go down to Juneau to, to press for that. On the other hand, uh, the university, for example, which is, which is seeking an increase in its budget, uh, uh, the, the mayor of Anchorage, who's seeking uh, $600 million for the port of Anchorage, port of Alaska, uh, in additional funding, uh, there's money in it for those people. I mean, if they can go down and they can get legislators to, to to grant them the money, it's well worth the small investment or the investment of spending the time and 
and you know hiring a lobbyist and spending the time to go down to Juneau to press for it. So it's the, the incentives. The incentives for those who want spending cuts don't translate into let's go to Juneau. I mean that's one of the things about about having the capital in in Juneau as opposed to Anchorage. If it was in or, or in, in South Central, if it was in Anchorage or somewhere else in South Central, people might get in their cars to go visit the legislators, right. to drive to the to the to the legislative office building to to go visit the legislators to to press for that. But but that's not. I mean, the setup we have now is you have to go down to Juneau to press for it, uh, and the incentives are only for those really work only for those people who are seeking additional funds, uh, and who have the money to hire lobbyists who want the additional funds and enough to. Uh, uh, view view that opportunity as as enough to pay for lobbyists uh, to go down there and press for it. So it's it's. I mean, you can see why that is, but 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 that's what it is. Well, and I think that's been again. That's why it's number two on the charter of changes. And I was arguing yesterday, maybe it should be number one that the legislative session should be on the road system. I mean, we do hear about a few meetings, a few. Uh, bills that are heard in testimony periods where 98% of the calls were to get the fiscal house in order and pay a full PFD. And then they look at the camera and they go, well, that's fine, but you guys just don't really understand the reality of the situation. Whereas if there had been a room full of 200, 300 people standing there, I just doubt that they would look them in the eye and say exactly the same thing. That's part of the problem. Yeah, it is part of the problem. And the, and the people who, you know, once the once the camera shuts down and they go back to their office, the people who are coming to their offices are people who are telling them, you know, Johnny's not going to be able to read or there's not going to you know, there's not going to be enough teachers or there's not going to be this or there's not going to be that. If the state doesn't the state doesn't uh, doesn't uh, uh, give more money. I mean, that's 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 what's going on right now. The University of Alaska has has pressed forward uh, for more money than uh, than the administration uh, than the administration proposed, not only did Governor Dunleavy not pursue the third year of spending cuts uh, that he'd originally agreed with the University of Alaska. The, the administration itself has proposed increased spending for the University of Alaska uh, in the FY23 budget. And now the university uh, has come down to the legislature and is proposing money on top of uh, additional money on top of what the governor's uh, increase uh, was proposed. Right. Uh, and, and as I said, the mayor of, of Anchorage the conservative mayor of Anchorage, the, you know, we're going to get our fiscal house in order. Mayor of Anchorage has gone down hat in hand for $600 million to, to help fund, uh, help fund the port of Anchorage, state dollars to help fund the port of Anchorage. So it's not, I mean, everybody now, now that there's, now that there's some money back on the table, uh, you're going to see a lot of people, uh, uh, pushing for, Oh, I just want a little bit for my thing. And, you know, my thing's important. The rest of the right. stuff, don't worry about that. But my thing's important. And you when you got 60 legislators, I mean, each of those legislators are going to have something that they think is important and they're going to press for. And that's how we got in this situation in the first place. The point I want to make about this, though, right. is, is we have, the, with, the, with the increase in traditional revenues uh, projected by uh, higher oil prices, we are barely at a balanced budget. I mean, we got we're right at the balanced budget uh, with those higher oil prices, uh, balanced balanced current law budget, which means a full statutory PFD. So now, if we spend, if we divert uh, uh, some of that money, or if we spend, if we decide to spend more on the University of Alaska, or we decide to give some to the city of Anchorage for its port, or any of the other. 50 asks that are going to be made of the legislature as we as we get into this budget process who's going to pay for it is going to be the pfd it's going to come out of the pfd because nobody's talking about substitute revenues now right um and so it's going to be what 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 we're what we're we're sort of at the high, you can view this as a, as the high water mark we've got the budget balanced at the statutory pfd we could do what the current law says uh, with the revenues we've got. But now we're going to have people coming in going, I need a little bit more for the university. I need a little bit more for K-12. through I need a little bit more for the city of Anchorage. I'm sure Fairbanks has projects. I'm sure Kenai has projects. I'm sure the Valley has uh, projects that they just want a little bit more. And this is more important than everybody else, but I just want a little bit more. And all of that, you can view that. I will view that as coming out of the PFD, that it's going to be middle and lower income Alaska families through cuts on what could otherwise be a full statutory PFD, 
uh, that's that's going to be paying for uh, all of these additional projects. So if we give the university a little bit more, it's it's middle and lower income Alaska families who have paid for it through PFD cuts. If we give Mayor Bronson six hundred million dollars or whatever portion of that the legislature decides to give him, it's going to be middle and lower income Alaska families that that are paying for that through uh, through PFD cuts. Well, and let's face it, a six hundred million dollar uh, give to the Port of Alaska or Port of Anchorage is puts us basically back almost exactly where we are right now, halfway to a statutory PFD. And as you say, they're not going to cut other programs to fund that money. They're going to look at, as they have in the past, they're going to look at the PFD and go, oh, easy fix. Here, take this money. Uh, even though it affects lower and middle income Alaskan families and has the highest impact on the uh, on the private economy, go ahead. We'll do that. That's exactly what they're going to do. It's the easiest route, and they've taken it before. Yep, exactly right. And it's just, I mean, we're, we're getting right back into the situation that we were in the, uh, in, throughout the 20 teens uh, of, of, you know, pushing for additional spending, additional spending. Then we had the shock absorber during that, during all of that time, we had the shock absorber of, of savings. And so, you know, we could tell ourselves, well, we're just going to give a little bit of savings this year. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll ride through this and it'll be okay. And we won't have to worry about it. And oil prices will come back up. Well, they never did. We ran through, you know, $20 billion between the, between the CBR and the SBR, we ran through $20 billion of, uh, of, of savings. Oil prices never came back up. Um, but we continued spending. And now, now that oil prices are coming back up a little bit, the pressure is going to be on to increase, uh, in not only, not, not only uh, 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 not cut, uh, but not even hold things, uh, hold the line on spending. The pressure is going to be on increasing spending. But we need I, people need to focus on the fact it's going to be coming out of the PFD. Right. But that's who's going to be paying for it. Middle and lower, it's going to be a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families are going to be paying for it. Period. Period. Uh, that we're already paying for. And now for the first time, it look like we get a re- little relief and no, sorry, no relief for you. Let's move on to number three, Brad, the governor, you know, not only are, will it be the university and others that'll be looking to spend this new money. Now the governor's proposing uh, a whole new energy program that I imagine is going to require a lot of state lucre to help grease the skid, so to speak on this renewable energy future. Yep, we've had uh, under under statutes passed when uh, Sarah Palin was governor. We've had a fifty percent uh, renewable power uh, mandate uh, on the ses- on on the books. We haven't we haven't come close to that, uh, but we've had one on the books. The governor proposes to replace that uh, with one that sets an eighty percent eighty percent of the rail belt's uh, energy would come from or electric energy would come from. Uh, renewable sources uh, by 2050, and uh, here's here's the ways that uh, one of the uh, the outside uh, uh, consultants that the that the administration of others others have been relying on uh, here's the here's the ways that they have proposed uh, that that could be achieved. One, uh, the state could build the vast Susitna Wantana. Watana hydroelectric project and bring the Bradley Lake hydroelectric uh, dam to full capacity. Uh, key words in that is the state could. Right. Second, the state could expand Bradley Lake, build dams at Grant Lake near Moose Pass and Snow River north of Seward, then add some wind and solar power. Three, it could expand Bradley Lake, but additional wind and solar. Four, it could use geothermal power and tidal power as well as wind. The the assumption in all of these is the state could. And basically what what you know what what Governor Dunleavy is proposing sounds great. Oh, 80 percent of our power ought to come come from renewable power. But what what that essentially is saying is the state ought to fund additional renewable projects, primarily the hydroelectric projects, the state ought to fund additional renewable projects uh, and recover uh, and uh, and and get to the renewable uh, uh, achievement that way. Not through private sector investment, right. not through not through market forces, but through state subsidies. And and, and you know the the, the statement 20, is well, 30, if we build all the, if we build all these capital projects, the operating costs will be lower. 
uh, of these projects, and so the and so the energy cost to consumers will be lower. Yeah, but it will have cost <laughs> us a bunch of upfront money to be able to right. do it. How much is the original investment going to be? That's the big thing. That's the big thing, Brad. Oh, okay, great. It'll be cheaper to operate. It'll be cheaper for us to have, uh, you know, it'll be lower energy in the long run. Nobody's talking about the initial investment that's being made with state dollars in the end. Oh, a lot of people are talking about it. Those, well, those people who, who who would get contracts to build those things. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, Kevin, I, I mean, if Kevin McCabe's still on, Kevin, you're going to get a lot of visits from people who will say, this renewable energy bill is a great thing because, wow, look at all this. You know, if we just spend a few billion dollars here and a few billion dollars there on capital projects, we'll have these lower operating costs going forward and the cost of power will go down. Well, yeah. Right. And you'll be stimulating the economy, right? And you'll be creating oh, yeah. jobs. I mean, you know, all these, I mean, it doesn't matter that they're, that they're short-term jobs and it doesn't matter that the cost of investment will far will never, you know, be paid back. But other than that, there you go. And whose pocket, whose pocket will it come out of? Once again, it'll be through PFD cuts because nobody's proposing a broader base substitute. It'll be PFD cuts. It'll come out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and they'll go to Kevin's office and they'll tell him all the great things it's going to do. Uh, and, and, you know, it's really to the benefit of Alaskans. So it's okay if we take their PFD uh, to be able to, uh, to fund it because they'll get the benefits of that. And it's just, I mean, it's just, it, we have, we have, Eisenhower called it back in the day, the military industrial complex. In Alaska, we have the government contracts uh, uh, industrial complex right. uh, going on. I mean, everybody, everybody's got an idea about how they can spend state money. Nobody can raise it privately. Everybody's got, but everybody's got a great idea about how they can, how they can spend state money. Um, and it just needs to. It, 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 it's just a little bit out of the pockets of of middle and lower income Alaska families. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, it's the crony capitalism complex that we have here in this state. Whether it's uh, places like GCI with all the telecom money, or the Association of General Contractors who are loving the fact that they want to build a new school building every twelve years, or whatever it is, it's all these different. It's all these. It's all these different people. They'd love to go down there into the legislators' offices and tell them why it's such a good idea to spend all that government money because they're the ones that are picking up the contracts for it. Yep, exactly right, Michael. And, and, and you know, back to Kevin's point, the middle- and lower-income Alaska families that are getting hosed uh, uh, through PFD, PFD cuts to pay for all this really don't have a voice in the, pro- in, in the process because, you know, they can't get to Juno to, to you know, compete – uh, uh, on a on an equal footing basis with the lobbyists and with the uh, with those uh, who are seeking the money. So it's a it's a mismatch uh, in terms of lobbying power, in terms of persuasive power. Uh, uh, the only the only pushback the only pushback that the ordinary citizen has is at the is at the voting booth. Right, right. Well, um, I. <laughs> This goes right back to the charter of changes, changing out the players and changing the venue and doing all that, uh, doing all that stuff um, is is. But I mean, that's kind of where we're at. We, we've got to get back to that, because otherwise we're going to just be faced with more of this and more of this and more of this uh, as we continue. It'll be business as usual all over again. Yeah. I mean, we, we see we see that we see that oil prices are up. We see the benefit of that to Alaskans in terms of being able to achieve uh, uh, at least for one year, a balanced budget, a balanced current law budget. Uh, but but all that's really doing, all those higher oil prices are really doing is activating the swarm to go in and say, oh, no, I can spend that money better than, than you know, mom and pop Alaskans can. So give me that money. Uh, increase, increase, as opposed to cutting the university, as, as the governor originally proposed, give me, give me not only the increase the, the administration has proposed, give me an additional amount. Uh, on top of that, you give me six hundred million dollars to the port of Anchorage. Give me this and that uh, for various other projects uh, throughout the state, and 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 we'll be good. Stu- we'll we'll spend that money well. It'll really benefit uh, Alaskans well, as opposed to letting the money flow as the current statutes provide in the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, so that uh, so that through their spending they can uh, stimulate the private sector. Well, I mean we. We'd love to see it. I mean, we'd love to see real private sector stimulation. 
We'd like to see those monies going into the hands of Alaskans instead of government picking winners and losers, which is what they've been doing, and doing such a bang up job of it at this point. Um, and uh, I mean, I would, I would, we would love to see that, but it's going to take again a wholesale change in how the legislature does business. And right now, uh, I mean, Rob Myers pointed out yesterday that we've, uh, in the, since 2016, we've changed out two thirds of the legislature. Unfortunately. We haven't changed out the one third that seems to matter at this point. Yeah, uh, we haven't changed the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we haven't changed the chairman of the, of the House Finance Committee. I mean, it's we, yes, we make changes, but but those changes once they get down to Juno don't translate into changes in the power structure in Juno. Right. Um, and and that's that's the disappointing part of it. I mean, that's um, I, I remember. Uh, uh, Bert Stedman had been chair of Senate Finance up until 2012. In the election of 2012, a bunch of new senators came in, replaced him as chair. Uh, but it didn't. I guess that didn't even uh, change things because we start. We just started spending down savings as opposed to as opposed to getting the budget in order. So um, it, it's a lot to be frustrated about. But we need to focus on the fact that this additional spending is coming out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. It is a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. As much as the legislature wants to overlook that or deny it or, or, uh, or shift, the, shift the discussion to other things, uh, this additional spending that the universities propose, that the mayor of Anchorage has proposed, that others will propose, that we'll see in the days forward, is coming out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. Well, Brad, as always, thought-provoking and irritating at the same time. Congratulations. You made it happen. So we appreciate <laughs> well, it. Thank you, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. All right. Appreciate you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.